So our keynote for this group on human impacts is Dan Vimont. He's an associate professor of atmospheric and oceanic sciences. And you see, if you stick around for my panel for the next uh, uh, later in the afternoon, I like to introduce them. You know, a lot of we have very distinguished faculty speaking to you all the time. But there's always some little interesting thing about them that I like to try to share to make them more accessible to you. And uh, Dan's thing is that he is very a very avid trout fisherman. And what was it, 21 inch brown trout? Yeah, the, the one, the, yeah. So at any rate, that's his claim to fame. And uh, so without, without any further ado, Dan, please. Thank you. So I was looking at the pictures on the, uh, on the poster on the way in, and they have there's these two very professional looking uh, pictures, and then there's this sort of ragtag dude in the middle uh, that's me, and uh, they actually cut off the more uh, the more attractive uh, animal on that picture. The, the trout that I'm holding is actually I think mostly cut off, but that was caught on the Big Green River um, uh, uh, to the west over by Fenimore. It was a rainbow trout, which is not native. Uh, the brook trout is native, and uh, that's a interesting. Uh, there's a, well, I'll talk a little bit about the brook trout and uh, impacts of climate change on brook trout. Uh, some of the research that was done with Wiki. All right, so climate change in Wisconsin. I'm going to give a brief overview of climate change. Uh, what we a very brief uh, overview of some of the projections uh, here in Wisconsin. And I always, uh, so if you've seen me give talks before, I apologize, I use the same jokes over and over again because I'm not creative enough to come up with new ones. So uh, I had a rowing, uh, rowing coach who said, if you see a turtle on a fence post, chances are he didn't get there by himself. So thanks to a number of people, Chris Kacharek, who, did a, who uh, uh, was uh, instrumental in some of the early uh, uh, climate, or the, the historical climate uh, projections and uh, folks at CCR and through Wiki. So I always start these talks with three things we know about climate change. First thing, and, and some of the, this is, this is now getting to be a little bit uh, outdated, uh, just because I don't think we need to emphasize. Most people know these now. First thing we know about climate change is that carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases in our atmosphere are increasing, and we know they are due to anthropogenic uh, sources of these greenhouse gases. That's one of the few things we've known for a few decades now. There's lots of evidence there I won't get into. Second thing we know about climate change is that our global temperature is warming. We've warmed by about a degree and a half since 1900, uh, and a lot of that warming has occurred in the last 50 years. And again, that's something that we know. Uh, technology for a thermometer has been around for several centuries. Um, we can look at lots of different uh, pieces of evidence. We can uh, deal with uh, issues like urban heat island effects and so forth. Third thing we know about climate change is that our planet is warmer due to the presence of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases than it would be if we did not have those gases in our atmosphere. And that's actually a good thing because it makes our, our planet habitable. However, too much of them then uh, is, is, or the rate of increase uh, of those greenhouse gases, too rapid a rate of increase can be a problem. So put all this together in the bottom, uh, statement here came from the latest IPCC assessment report. It is extremely likely that human influence has been the dominant cause of the observed warming since the mid 20th century. So that's great, but what does it mean on a local scale? Now let's actually, uh, before I do that, let me, let me uh, introduce two uh, concepts here. Where are we going? <laughs> Future, uh, as we look into the future, uh, we see that uh, our climate, uh, we, we can use models to project into the future and how much, we, how much warming we expect is going to depend on uh, how our global society evolves. And so we come up with various storylines of how our, how our global society could evolve and depending on how much greenhouse gases we emit over the next century, uh, we could see anywhere between say a degree of warming I think is probably unlikely, and uh, four degrees of warming, or even more than that, uh, by the end of the century. By mid-century, they're all about the same. By mid-century, we expect to see about a degree of warming. So uh, what we do now in terms of uh, reducing the amount of greenhouse gases has a huge effect late in the century 
but not as much of an effect early on, and that's important. So uh, in dealing with climate change, there's two things we can do. One is mitigation. We can uh, mitigation our, our uh, actions that we can take to reduce the amount of climate change that we might expect. And mitigation is necessary to come from this, this, red, this red line here, which the, the thing I am most frightened about this red line is the fact that the slope is still positive. It's still increasing very rapidly by the end of the century. Uh, mitigation would take us from this red line to say this light blue line, which we can't see, but which is probably uh, um, hopefully, which is probably more likely than this dark blue line. But even if we are able to, uh, to mitigate, even we are, if we are able to, to come to some global consensus and, and reduce the amount of uh, greenhouse gases we're emitting, there's an inevitable amount of climate change that is already going to happen. If we were to freeze carbon dioxide levels at, at the levels they are currently at, right? I mean, this would be a massive shock to our global economy if we were to freeze carbon dioxide levels where they are currently at. We will still see the same amount of warming that we have already seen, about a degree and a half, because it takes so long for the climate system to warm up. The, the, the oceans have a lot of heat capacity, so it takes long enough for them to warm up uh, that we would still see about the same amount of warming as we have already seen. So there is an inevitable amount of warming that we are already committed to that we have to be ready, uh, we have to be thinking about adapt adapting to. So adaptation is the other side of dealing with climate change. About 10, 15 years ago, no one talked about adaptation because it was like admitting defeat. Uh, these days, uh, adaptation is recognized as an uh, essential part of, the, uh, uh, of this equation. So moving from global to local. Wisconsin Initiative on Climate Change Impacts uh, is, a, uh, is a, um, a network of individuals, an organization that, uh, that looks at adapting to climate change in Wisconsin. And as part of this effort, ah, Wiki, the, <laughs> the left plot here is, uh, I don't think Chris, have you seen this one? This one, Chris has seen me talk like 500 times here. He hasn't seen this one, so he's laughing at this. Yes, I love this plot here because it's, it's to me, what Wiki is. Uh, it's uh, Wiki, you can think of Wiki as these red dots here. What Wiki does is it connects people who may not otherwise talk to each other. And in that connection, it changes, it, it allows research and knowledge to uh, emerge due to the, the crossing of boundaries and so forth in ways that are really exciting. And I think Wiki is a microcosm, as an example of sustainability, and I'll give that ex uh, how I justify that a bit. So <clears throat> this is work by Chris Kucherik, and these show trends in Wisconsin uh, since, uh, from 1950 to 2006. And uh, if we look at just the actual observations in Wisconsin, so Chris did a, uh, a great job of, of finding uh, uh, station data in Wisconsin, people who go out and they measure the uh, maximum minimum temperature over the last 24 hours and the, and the precipitation that, that fell over 24 hours. And he uh, uh, and his group put together a, uh, a gridded data set of this, de of this uh, temperature and precipitation. And this is the uh, change from 1950 to 2006. And so we see that since 1950, Wisconsin has warmed by about the same amount as the global average. So, uh, and in some regions, it's been on the order of two degrees uh, Fahrenheit warmer uh, over the last 50 years. If we look, to, if we look forward, uh, and this is work done at the Center for Climatic Research, uh, using the same uh, observational network uh, that Chris used for uh, the historical analyses. If we look forward at, at how climate change can affect our region, uh, we find that, uh, that Wisconsin will warm by somewhere around, I don't know, five or six degrees uh, Fahrenheit, uh, six degrees Fahrenheit by mid-century. And our, uh, this, is, this is not something that, uh, as, a, as a climate scientist, this bugs me, right? Uh, warming by five degrees, is that five plus or minus 10? Is that five plus or minus one? What's the range there? And so one of the things we did is we tried to quantify uh, the range of possible warming that we might expect based on a number of different climate models that contributed to the, uh, the IPCC fourth assessment report. And when we do that, we can actually quantify the range of expected warming. So we find that Wisconsin will warm by somewhere between three and nine degrees Fahrenheit uh, by mid-century. 
Those numbers now have meaning to them. The 3 is the 10th percentile, and 9 is the 90th percentile. So what that means is there's a 90% chance that the warming will exceed 3 degrees Fahrenheit, but there's also a 90% chance it won't exceed eight, uh, 9 degrees Fahrenheit. Now we can start making decisions based on this information. And I'll show you an example of how that, that's, that was done by the trout working group, uh, or the uh, cold water fish working group in Wiki. <sighs> One thing that we see in the observations, and this is what's really neat about having the two data sets, the, the historical observations and uh, the future projections. One thing we find in both of them is that historically, the most warming that we've, we've seen, the most warming during the wintertime and nighttime temperatures warm more than uh, daytime temperatures. We find the same thing projected by climate models, uh, downscale climate model simulations. And so uh, warming is most pronounced by, uh, uh, in, for winter nights. Wisconsin winters warm by 5 degrees to 12 degrees Fahrenheit by mid 21st century. And if you're thinking to yourself that last night was not an example of that, <laughs> uh, so am I. Uh, I do, I, I, I am reminded uh, by my colleagues that uh, December was the third warmest uh, December globally uh, in, in the recorded history, and January was the fourth warmest January globally. And this is when there's not an El Nino going on, so this is really remarkable. We're still a very warm planet. And what this points out is the importance of weather, right? That there are these variations each year. And we need to be thinking about these variations. We need to be understanding how these variations uh, uh, occur. <clears throat> OK, so what does it mean? Uh, one of the things, one of the messages I like to try and uh, uh, hammer is that uh, we can talk all we want about what the actual climate change could look like, but sometimes it's hard to really identify with that. And so it's, it's much easier to identify with how it affects things that we see on a daily basis. So this is the. Uh, the, this is a f classic time series around here. This is the uh, duration of ice cover on Lake Mendota. You don't need to draw the trend line in here to see the reduction in the, the, the length of uh, time that Lake Mendota is frozen over. And I always like pointing out 1881 here. We've got like 162 or something like that days of ice cover on Lake Mendota. Right? <laughs> That's either depressing or awesome. That's, 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 uh, 2000, is that 2001 is not awesome. That's depressing. That was only uh, about 20 or 15 or 20 days of ice cover. And so that's a, that's a huge difference. Right? So uh, the impacts of that are uh, on tourism, uh, reduced opportunities for fishing. That's, that's depressing. Anybody remember kites on ice? Yeah, yeah. That's just, it's a thing of the past. I don't know if it's due to climate change, but certainly I don't think anyone's going to insure uh, 40,000 people out on Lake Mendota. And then I always ask, uh, does anybody know what this is? Yeah, great, great. And, and in audiences like this, I hear an answer that is, oh, it's a piping plover. Right? And, <laughs> and people know. And when I say this to my 100 class, they, there's some dude in the back who puts his newspaper down and says, it's a bird. <laughs> so, yes, piping plover. So why do we, why have, why have a piping plover up there? Well, it turns out that the piping plover is uh, an endangered shorebird. And uh, one of the impacts of climate change on the piping plover, there are lots of impacts, but one of them is that when there is sea ice, or when there is lake ice, it scours vegetation on the shore. And piping plovers build their nest on, on the shore. And so by scouring that vegetation, it gets rid of places where predators can hide. So the piping plover is one of these birds that pretends like its wings broken when there's a predator around and distracts the predator away from the nest. Uh, so when there's, when there's lake ice that scours that vegetation, that's good for the piping plover. There is no way that as a climate scientist, I would ever know this. Right? The only reason I know this is because I've had the opportunity to interact with people who know about, I would say, I'm the dude in the back saying it's a bird. Right? <laughs> it's because I have the opportunity to interact with people who do know this. And that's what's really cool about Wiki and what's really cool about this forum and efforts at sustainability. 
Sustainability is a learning process that occurs when people share information. They're assessing the state of the system. And in doing that, we, develop, we, we build resiliency, and that's what sustainability, and that's one definition of sustainability. That's what I think uh, Wiki tries to do. Other impacts of, uh, of the wintertime warming, reduced uh, snow cover. Um, Wausau, looks, Wausau in the future looks more like Milwaukee today. That's the, uh, I'm not going to describe these, but that's a take home message from these plots. The Berkebiner is already taking actions to try and deal with these kinds of conditions. They're, they're making sure that their trail is, uh, is um, uh, that they can maintain uh, snow, that they're grooming regularly. They've, they've got a summertime, uh, or a, a uh, uh, September trail run, which looks really cool. Uh, and um, they're, doing, they're doing things to, to uh, adapt to that already. Fewer extremely cold days, which means uh, <coughs> impacts on forestry. So the, one of the impacts on forestry is that in wintertime, uh, forestry relies on frozen ground in order to get in and remove uh, logs. Right? If the ground isn't frozen, they can't get their equipment in. And so forest, uh, forestry companies are already building gravel roads into regions where they've never had to in the past. That's an economic uh, uh, hit to their bottom line. Summertime, warmer summers. Uh, in uh, summertime, temperatures are expected to warm by 3 to 8 degrees Fahrenheit. And there's this great work that was done by Matt Mitro and other folks at the DNR. Um, this is now outdated, and I'll, I'll explain uh, subtle differences, but the overall message is the same, where they took a look at uh, what warming means for trout. So brook trout, uh, mortality rates uh, increase considerably when temp stream temperatures get above 19 degrees Celsius. So <clears throat> I think, and this is another example of why I can't do this problem as a climate scientist. My thought was that it was due to reduced oxygen in the water, right? And that's, I think, what most people think, oh yeah, warmer temperatures, reduced oxygen, it'd be tough for the fish to survive. It's not that, it's the metabolism, evidently. And this is now where I'm way out on a limb because I know nothing about, uh, about metabolism of Cold water fish, but evidently the enzymes that you that are used to convert energy start unraveling. Does that make sense? Great. That's, <laughs> I, that's that's as far as I can go there. So, so this is what happens. So they can they can identify based on the temperature of the stream which streams uh, will support brook or brown trout. Brook is the only native trout in Wisconsin. Brook trout's on the left. This is the current climate. Wherever you see a blue uh, stream here is a place that supports brook trout or brown trout. Remember the 3 to 8 degrees warming. Those are quantified. That's the 10th percentile and the 90th percentile. There's a median right in the middle there, which is I think about 5 degrees. <coughs> With 1 degree Celsius air temperature, a change in air temperature. So this is the low end of the warming in summer. We see a 44% decrease in brook trout habitat, 8% decrease in brown trout. That's the low end. The middle end, 94% decrease in brook trout. The high end, there is no brook trout uh, habitat left in the state. Recent projections have now included uh, changes in, in groundwater input to these, these streams. And what we find is that there are a few uh, refuges left for brook trout in the, uh, in the driftless area. Uh, which is good, but the overall picture is still the same. Trout fishing is a billion dollar industry for the, the, uh, uh, the driftless area. And for me, it's, yeah. That was not a billion dollar. <clears throat> Extreme heat uh, in the summertime, increases in temperature uh, are the biggest source of, um, uh, there are more deaths in uh, Wisconsin due to uh, heat waves than all of the natural disasters combined. So that's something that uh, cities need to be thinking about. All right, so sustainability and climate change. This is, the, this is my second to last slide here. So Back to our idea of what wiki is here. So one definition of sustainability is that it's a process. In a complex adaptive system, there is no equilibrium end state oftentimes. And oftentimes we think of sustainability 
as an end state that we're, that we're trying to, to reach for. And sustainability instead can be thought of as a process, it can be thought of as a learning process, is what we're doing right here, right? We're learning about climate change in this case, but we could be, I'm learning from uh, wildlife managers, I'm learning from people in this room, and in sharing that information, we identify where we might be vulnerable. And so these kinds of events are sustainability, right? <clears throat> so this is what Wiki does. Wiki sets up an opportunity for people to interact and for people to, to learn and, uh, about the state of the system and to reduce vulnerability uh, as a result. So thank you everyone for coming. This is, it's kind of exciting. This is, you are uh, producing sustainability, if, that, if, you can, if you can say it in that way, uh, in this state by being here. So thank you. Thank you.